Wow. Um, I'm always excited to come to a new audience of people. Um, most of the time I speak with students, um, often with politicians these days, sometimes industry leaders. But you're probably the most diverse group, and I was actually a little nervous coming in here today. Um, the topic is really general. This is, this is, I didn't know what you had, uh, how you'd been prepared for synthetic biology, so I'm pretty much going to start from scratch. And I, I, my goal here is to give you a foundation in these technologies, something that took me a long time to, to get myself over the years, and uh, to kind of prepare you for some of the applications uh, that may be coming forward, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So the title is Hacking Genomes and Synthetic Biology. And I usually start off with just what is synthetic biology? Because most of the people that I deal with have never heard the term before. I was looking on Wikipedia just yesterday, and these are just some of the various classifications of biology, and I don't expect you to read them. Let's just say that biology is fragmented into a lot of different disciplines. And synthetic biology is not on this list. Synthetic biology is pretty new. In fact, the first time I came across the actual uh, name, synthetic biology, was 2003. Before that, I'd been talking about it with various groups. Hadn't, it hadn't been given a name that had kind of stuck in the scientific literature. And until you have that, it's really hard to look for it. My whole foundation, and this is, was news that uh, it's actually been relayed to you, my whole foundation uh, is that cells are information processors. They're processors, inputs, outputs. And that, the, and that DNA is a programming language for those cells. Um, it's, a, it's quite a remarkable programming language because not only does it guide the, the, how the cell processes information, most of which is chemical, but there's also electrical information. How, it guides how the metabolism is coordinated, but it also specifies the structure and manuf uh, the manufacturing of, of the hardware. And that's the unique part of it and the thing that I think is really interesting. Others have drawn parallels to this before, taking a look down at the component level, the physical bits of computers. we drawn the comparisons all the way up from the basic bits through the components up to full systems. Uh, I think that it, this slide really summarizes a lot of what we're trying to teach people these days about genetics and synthetic biology. We can look at biological systems much like computer networks, and because we have s so much experience today with hardware, with software, with large-scale computing networks, we're actually learning about our, our biology through the building out of these systems. In fact, if you compare across computing versus and, and life, essentially, we find a lot, of, a lot of things that are identical. And it's not surprising. Digital code. We have, there's open standards. There's modular code. It's actually already object-oriented. There's error protection systems and data compression and on and on. But it's not really surprising when you think about it because engineering... Uh, well, we want to use, we want things to work faster and more efficiently and use less energy. And nature's trying to do the same thing too. It's just taking a roundabout way and different mater building materials to do it. So I usually go into synthetic biology by talking a little bit about the history of computing. And you guys almost certainly know more about computing than I do. Um, I got interested in computers a long time ago, not quite this long ago, but. My, I'm not, I'm a dabbler. One of the first um, instances of a, of a computer or calculator was the Antikythera mechanism. So really about 2,100 years ago. That's, that's pretty short in, in, in time. Complicated mechanism on the order of, of, a, of a Swiss watch in many ways. We quickly advanced through various mechanical calculating systems, ultimately to devices like analog computers, until we got to this little baby. And I'm sure you've seen this before. This is the first transistor. And it looks like something you could have hacked together in your basement uh, <laughs> with some gravel from the backyard and an old paper clip and a soldering iron. And this is, to me, one of the most important pieces of equipment ever made. And it's launched a 
a trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar industry in many of my, many careers, and it certainly paid my bills for most of my life, even though I'm trained by a biologist. The digital computer advanced very quickly. It's an, uh, engineers are really good at building things and translating ideas. The mainframe model stuck with us for a long time. And um, really, by the time that I was uh, in my impressionable teens, I was watching movies that made this seem like one of the most exciting worlds to be in, the world of computing. It also gave rise to a whole new culture of innovators, first working at the hardware level, developing you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak here working, you know, you know, they founded Apple out of a garage. Started to advance into the mainstream through devices like this. And I remember going and getting one of these computers and thinking, wow, this is so much fun. Remember getting one of these, thinking, wow, this is so much fun too. We quickly moved away from just we, quick, we quickly saw evolution in the manufacturing of computer hardware. Whole new business models popping up. Michael Dell, of course, famously launching Dell from a, from a dorm room, building a multi-billion dollar organization simply by, by changing the manufacturing model. And then we started to link all those computers together, building a backbone. I remember when Mark Andreessen and the first browsers have started to appear. This, this, we had people using computers now on a network. They needed some way to start exchanging information quickly, getting the network out of it. The internet became a big, massive, hairy place. And I love this because it kind of looks like a cell with fluorescence microscopy. To navigate and search, we ended up getting new innovators and new companies all moving very quickly. And we'll probably end up with something like this in a few more years. Evolution of equipment moves very quickly once we starts to hit the mainstream. Lots of diversity, massive amounts of diversity, a few dominant species. And now moving beyond the hardware, moving beyond the networking, moving beyond mobility, we started to connect the actual brains. The brains and the people, the lives behind the machines start to take importance. Connected in whole new ways again. And now we're actually linking together the brains with the computer systems directly. And you've probably been given some background in this. This is actually trying to read the, the visual cortex using functional MRI. And it's fascinating work. Direct brain connections. A monkey that's been hooked into a robotic controller. Toyota demonstrating a neural controlled wheelchair. And a concept that for a new Apple product. Um, which, uh, you know, I can actually, is not really that far beyond the realm of possibility. So that's a really short history of computing, kind of through a network of people and some key innovations. But where you see is it moves very quickly. It's short, 2,100 years. It's forward engineering. We build upon, we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's a human-controlled evolutionary path. We have the stories. We can share specifications and standards. Uh, we built and control every part of it. We understand it. The evolution of cells is a little more complicated. It's a little different. Those biological processors are, are a completely different challenge, and here's why. This is how life supposedly started on this planet. Billions of years ago, it was, this is a picture of Venus apparently, but I imagine it looks something pretty much like this. It was a chemically active place. And somewhere in, probably in many areas, we started to see chemical reactions go to completion and start to look at some form of encapsulation, being able to create new microenvironments for reactions to occur. And these processes kept getting refined. Physical chemistry started to uh, 
create biochemistry. Today, if you look in a drop of seawater, there's just an incredible diversity of organisms. These are applications. These, this, is what we, this is the app store. <laughs> it's tremendous variability. Plants that can photosynthesize, take energy and carbon from the air and, and, and make wood and other products. And, of course, a range of organisms that utilize energy and ecological niches, including us. We have a remarkable processor as well, a higher order processor than the other life forms. And that's a whole different story. This is a talk on synthetic biology, but one day, not so far away, someone's going to come and talk about synthetic neurobiology. But when you're trying to figure out how to work with these processors, you know, this runs through my mind all the time. Ah, why? How? Where do you even start? It really wasn't that long ago that we started to put the bits and pieces together and even recognize that there were connections between these different applications. That there were, you could actually follow the evolution of the applications. We still didn't know how the applications were controlled. Rosalind Franklin, Watson Crick figured out just the structure of DNA, got the hint of how information was actually transferred, the basic structure of, of the gene. The central dogma, which I understand you've covered, the idea that DNA is is your storage repository that you end up making working copies, just like you were making photocopies in a library, and that those working copies and blueprints would go on to construct the actual hardware. Was, that was revolutionary. And now we know that there's some special cases, and there's still, it's still unknown whether information flows both ways. It took another, it took another 10 to 15 years to figure out how the genetic code was actually translated into, into amino acids. Some incredible work by these biochemists to produce this one diagram that actually allows us to correspond DNA with protein. I love these pictures. On the left-hand side is a bacteria. It's probably E. coli. It's just been squashed. And it's genetic material has literally been pressed out of it. And this little piece of spaghetti is about five megabases. It's nothing. Five megabases. But that it's incredibly compact, incredibly powerful, and there's about 5,000 genes on that little strand of material. We only have about 25,000 genes. It's packaged in a much more complex way. On the right is human metaphase chromosomes, about six billion base pairs of DNA. Six gigabits, you get us. Five megabits, you get a bacteria. Bacteria aren't simple organisms. They're just really compressed. We started to read this code. Back in the late 70s, in a significant way. Fred Sanger won two Nobel Prizes. He, was, he developed the Sanger method of sequencing DNA. It was terrible. Believe me, you did not want to do this. It was toxic. It was radioactive. It was hard work, and it was hard on the eyes trying to read code in this way. But it allowed you to take chemical information from living organisms, write it out as letters, and ultimately digitize it. And that was really cool. And when I first started getting into genetics, and computers, we were at pretty much at this stage. If you could sequence 500 base pairs in a day, you were God. We started to really refine the equipment quite quickly. Again, engineering. By 1987, machine companies were making a fortune selling these semi-automated sequencers. The same form, just refinements through to 1995. And then we got the breakthrough with fully automated capillary sequencers. 
this is the ABI 3700 on, in the upper right-hand corner, which was the workhorse of the Human Genome Project. An amazing shift in technology, and today you've already seen that we've got sequencing by synthesis, and we're probably going to be popping out human genomes in literally minutes to hours at a cost you could put on your credit card. I used to think this was the biggest hockey stick in the world. It's not. I just learned it's the second biggest hockey stick. <laughs> the biggest hockey stick, apparently, is in Canada, in British Columbia. But this is a better picture, so I'm going to keep using it. But this, to me, is the, is the most important hockey stick right now in terms of genetics. And this is just the growth of GenBank. I got my first copy of GenBank around this point, and it came on floppy disk. They mailed it to you. Here you go. Thanks. When they upgraded to CDs, I swore because I actually had to upgrade my hardware. They started distributing on the web. And since we started making those automated sequencers, it's taken off. But even this is, is nothing. We're just starting to get going. We have hundreds of billions of base pairs of DNA, really powerful information, just sitting around. We need comprehension to make sense of all this. Again, DNA is a language. Reading, comprehension. We can make maps. We make lots of maps with this data, and now you can make a whole bacterial genomic map just by dropping the, your sequence code into a nice little processor, and it'll annotate it and do all your comparisons, and you don't have to do that much work. That's really cool. We're sequencing species faster and faster now. So the next hockey stick to kind of follow this will be the number of species that we've sequenced. This is uh, updated as of last night, 5,656 species listed in GenBank plus whatever's in the proprietary databases. And now we're able to make those little wonderful pictures that Darwin sketched out a lot more interesting, a lot more complicated, and a lot more detailed, but still working pretty much the same way. We're also learning that all those proteins don't just sit there in the cell doing nothing. They have a beautiful social network. This is just a, f a little bit of the social network of some of the proteins in E. coli. Essentially, this is just Facebook. We're also learning how to take that information, the genetic information, go to protein and start saying, hey, what's the three-dimensional shape of those proteins? <laughs> in fact, generating a picture like this, a, uh, the the three-dimensional structure of a protein requires some pretty heavy-duty horsepower. In fact, it also, today, it's easier if we actually tap into some human brains to do it, too. You may have seen the article in Wired about Foldit, but we've been getting students using Foldit, which is essentially just looking for people who naturally are gifted at twisting proteins into the right shape and using the, them to, t and giving, putting the computer in their service. We've also got Folding at Home, which is apparently one of the largest distributed computing networks, crunching away on this type of data because it takes a lot of computing power. And I recognized this about 10 years ago when I was working for Amgen because Amgen, well, I guess it's still the biggest biotech company by revenue, not sure by market cap, but working for them kind of gave me this view as to where biology was going before most of the academic groups because we just had basically unlimited resources to throw at it. And what I learned working with them is you can throw a billion dollars at these types of problems and not really go too far. You have to kind of change your thinking around it. So I, I had this philosophical shift in the late 90s where I realized, man, you know, if we didn't build it, we're probably never really going to understand it. Nothing against systems biology and, and, and protein folding and all the other work that we do, but we're always going to have gaps in that knowledge, and it's always going to take a lot of power to go and try and figure out what happened and to reach back. So I kind of rebooted my whole life, my whole system, and I thought, I'm just going to focus on writing, and we're just going to start building our applications from scratch, bottom up. Now, we've been writing genetic code for quite a while. Back in the early 1970s, we discovered that there were enzymes that could chop genetic code at precise places, molecular scissors, and we had molecular glue, and we started doing a little bit of molecular scrapbooking, and that's how we did genetic engineering. We literally did cut and paste. 
It was powerful, and it was important, and it got the covers of a lot of magazines like this. It really started to wake people up to the power and potential of this. And today, if you look around a molecular biology lab, you'll see something that looks very much like this. And we still work in very much the same way as in the early 1970s. It's complicated technical cooking. We're good at it. If you're, really, if you're well funded, you'll end up getting a robot. Usually, you'll have grad students because they cost a lot less. But here's what we're doing. Yes? Quick question. Have you heard like, the story of DNA Chef today? Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw the, uh, I think it's rather new, the DNA printer. Yes. It basically now sequences it. <laughs> what extent is that, is that really revolutionary? That's, that's a major revolution. This is what I'm getting to. Oh, sorry. The question was uh, uh, really the DNA printer. What is it a paradigm shift? And yes, that's the whole point of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is basically founded on this idea that if you can write DNA, you're no longer limited to your application development, and you're no longer tied to that bench. These are some examples of older DNA printers. They're getting a lot better. They're still not great. There's companies that will go out and manufacture any DNA code that you want. Just email it to them, send them your credit card number, and they will give it to you. It's making all the old equipment junk. You can buy this on eBay. It's just no one's bidding on it. Trust me, it's a doorstop. But we still haven't seen the paradigm shift breakthrough in the technology, the stuff that will really make it cheap and really promote a lot of application development. And I figure it'll come pretty much when we hit this this point, when you can get 10 million base pairs in an hour for 100 bucks or less. Why? Because this will allow you to genetically engineer virtually any organism. It'll allow you to build any bacteria or virus from scratch for essentially nothing. Once we hit this point, the application space completely explodes. But, of course, we're going to ramp up to that pretty quickly. On the software side, we're seeing better and better editors. Just you know, they're for, the companies will let you use it if you buy their DNA. We're also starting to see the development of a true genetic programming language where we can start using modularized parts, where you can start linking these things together and modeling what's going to happen and doing your debugging kind of online. From the abstract of that last paper, there's this quote, an ultimate dream is to design, press a button and have the design translated to DNA sequences that can be synthesized and put to work in living cells. Really, that's probably one of the best summaries of synthetic biology around. It's push-button biology. What do you mean by a design? You dream, you want a bacteria that turns sunlight into... Um, perfect, yes. Um, anything you can dream of you can model and create in a living organism and have a fairly good, on a first pass, a good expectation that it'll work. So if, if, if you treat the design as a model and DNA sequence as a programming language, it is fairly possible already now. Yes, but only with a very, very simple. Right now, the comment is you can do this today, but the applications are still very simple. Okay. Yes, we need to work up several orders of magnitude. So really what we're seeing now is in this shift is it's not really, we're not worrying so much about how to engineer something as to what to engineer. In 2003, these guys came to my attention, Tom Knight and Drew Endy, and they were really uh, important in raising the awareness of synthetic biology. They're both engineers, which was significant. They didn't come from the world of biology naturally. They started to bring engineering ideas into biology. And they created a little program called iGEM, which you may have heard about and you'll certainly hear more about, International Genetically Engineered Machines. And really, all they were doing was taking some of the very simple ideas from electronics, like these hobby kits. I know I had one when I was a kid, and maybe you did too, where you, if you take certain components and allow people to rewire them in different ways, you can make different projects, because the com components can be reused and reconfigured. And they took ideas like this, where you actually go out and market to kids. This was a comic book that Radio Shack put out that just gave enough information about their computers that you, kids would go and bug their parents to buy them a computer. And we saw that it actually did create a generation of whiz kids. So Drew and Tom and others 
created a registry of standard biological parts, essentially genetic components, both in electronic form and a physical form, and they made comic books, and they said, go out and make things. And they started with one team at MIT, some parts that were funded by DARPA, and this program has grown because they've said, anything you make, share how you made it, share the parts. And because all the parts fit together like Lego, if someone builds a more sophisticated part, takes components and builds an amplifier, now you can use that amplifier in a more complex system. This was last year. There were about 950 people participating. This year, there's 112 teams registered, about 1,500 people from 25 countries. It's still growing, and I spend a lot of my time trying to hook more people into this. That kit of parts is now worth approximately three or four million dollars in terms of aggregate value, and we just give it away. And now we're pushing, people from high schools are starting to move into it. Um, that's the big growth area right now, and I'd love to see it go down into junior high. And this variant of iGEM, do-it-yourself biology, spun off of it last year, and it's moving even faster because it doesn't have the same rules and structure as the iGEM program, which is now largely a competition. On the left is uh, the lab of Catherine All, one of the DIY biologists. She literally has a little molecular biology lab in her closet. Really sweet. I think we're also going to see molecular biology labs on iPhones soon enough. I'm launching a, a magazine, just a PDF, but an amazing response to this already called Garage Bio, just to start getting information out to people that wouldn't normally be exposed in the biological community. So look for this later in the year. What's driving all this? Mainly economics. Uh, the pace and cost of this stuff is, is, uh, is just coming down. We saw it with sequencing already. Sequencing used to be very expensive. Synthesis is following the exact same curve, lagging by about eight years. So if you can sequence a human genome in a day for a few thousand bucks, we're going to get to that point very quickly with synthesis. And what I think we'll see, you know, someone's going to put up their hand in the next little while and say, hey, why don't we do a human genome synthesis project? It's coming. Right now, like most code, the more code you can write, the more complex the application. It took 20 years, approximately, to go from 100 base pairs to 1,000 base pairs in writing. 10 years to go to 10,000 and so on. It's having the time to start writing more code is dropping quickly, and that opens up the application space. Right now, Craig Venter holds the record of the published largest synthesis at about 600,000 base pairs. You know, he's already translated that into a company that's valued on paper at over a billion. Um, essentially, code is going to be free. Like, the compiling cost is trivial. So synthetic biology, if you really want to summarize it, it's really the next IT industry, another IT industry. But one that I've always believed is probably going to be, uh, could be in many ways, more important than the last one. Because I know life is important. Life is key. We have billions of lives on this planet. Saving one of them, if you could save one, you've done something tremendous. If you can save hundreds of thousands or millions or billions, you, you change the world at a fundamental level. So ultimately, this is what we're getting. This is what I've been trying to, in my work, which is really just going out and doing a lot of communications these days, this is what I've been trying to add grease to. This is the wheel of innovation in computing, essentially design, compilation, execution, and testing. And out of that loop, out of that wheel, you end up getting applications that are incredibly varied. I don't know where your interests will take you into this loop. You all have computers sitting in front of you, and I know most of you didn't build them from scratch. Um, but chances are this loop in biology will affect your life. And tomorrow, we'll talk about some of the applications and the social implications. But that's where I want to leave it today and just move forward with some discussion. Thank you.
sorry. Um, I'll ask the trivial question. You know, a computer virus, you back up, you restore, usually no big deal. If this is going really like anybody can read, write DNA, this gets, this gets a little bit scary. Right. So the, the question, the comment was, uh, with a computer virus, you can restore the system. With biology, this gets a little scary. That's something that people move to that very quickly. Uh, the thing that I usually point out to most people, what we're doing at this point is, is really walking in the footsteps of a process that, uh, that has been happening and has naturally happened on this planet for billions of years. And the only reason why we're here is because we've developed our firewalls and our defenses and our immune systems to, to work in a highly dynamic, highly evolutionary environment. So to, it is possible to take these biological organisms and make weapons, absolutely. But you cannot do that without using these information, or you can't do it effectively without using information technologies. And information technologies has about a 30-year head start over anything we're doing here in terms of ramping up in Moore's Law, et cetera. So if we can defend our computer systems, we can defend biological systems because we can literally, if you can find the people that are going to act as, as cyber terrorists and do cyber warfare, this is, this is just an, a, a layer beneath that. Yes. Yes. And a color laser printer won't print money. The question was, is, is there, are, are defenses coming into place? Are we linking all the DNA printers to some government database so it validates the sequence before it prints it, or some very trivial action such as this? Again, the comment was, are we, are we putting in defenses at the level of DNA synthesis, which is a really key point, because that's the translation of the idea into the reality. And the answer is yes. People have raised, uh, people have, uh, have pointed out that this is a crucial point and that we should be doing our best to start defending that. Is it being done well? Is it being done universally? No. But, but that's where we're moving to. You're going to see a whole defense industry, both, you know, uh, and awareness grow from this very quickly. Um, there's money to be made. If there's money to be made, people will start to move in this area. Um, and so... Will there be accidents? Yes. Will there be mistakes? Yes. Will there be a global pandemic that, that uh, based on some engineered virus uh, knocking us out? I think the, the risks of that are, are compared to the other real challenges that we have in the world today are, are quite low. It's certainly non-zero, but, but it's not what's keeping me awake at night. This, yeah. So... There's an interesting crossover point that's going to happen. First of all, great lecture. Thank you. Um, the crossover point is when you're looking to build a robot, do you build it out of electromechanical parts or biological parts? So you can have a, a Roomba that's cleaning your carpet, <clears throat> or you can genetically engineer some kind of a... Um, oh, I like this. Uh, like a, a cat a, without a, legs that can roll as a dust mop. And, and from my standpoint, it pees stain remover and it eats lint. And so the question really is, and, and so I, I welcome the students to think about the, in all seriousness, think about when do you biologically engineer a satellite that is a, a deep space probe versus mechanically. And so I'm just curious your thoughts of when the crossover point occurs where you make an active decision, do I build it biologically or do I build it electromechanically? We, the, um, the crossover point, I believe, is within... Uh, the consideration, the window of consideration of the Singularity University, shall we say. I think this century is, will be the transformative century. Uh, whether it's 25 years or 50 years, will, or 75, um, re, is the question. But these, this is a digital technology. It's an accelerating technology with the same dynamics as computing. So today... Today, computers have a head start, but there, there is a tremendous economic cost 
and societal cost for manufacturing with, to make devices like this. You need specialized plants. The, the, these are, there's a lot of toxic reagents. These are, are very specialized manufacturing tools necessary to make something like this. Life is really robust, and it self-assembles into very complex structures. It's powered by sugars and sunlight. It breaks down naturally. Um, it's cheap to make. So, so when the designs, when the, when the energy and the economics of going to the design uh, is less than for a biological machine, to, to make that biological machine that will work as intended versus using, versus using electronics and computers, then, then we've got a competitive marketplace or biology will win. Yeah, and, yeah. and just the, the follow-on is then the conversation that will ensue about the morality of the biologics that you produce de novo and their... Uh, and their, and their utilization. So it's going to be, I mean, it's, I just think this is, this is part of the heart of, of the fun conversations to be had here. Well, and, and this is just it. The morality is an interesting part because we generally don't think of morality and these devices. Um, living things are held in very high regard. Um, so what happens if you have a, what happens when you have a cat that's been genetically engineered so that it's smart enough to recognize uh, when when a child is in distress and dial nine one one, you know when when do we start saying that we have to protect these animals and creatures that we design and give them the same protections as we might a human or other uh, s s organism? Please. Um, I was going to ask two questions. The one, first one is related to this previous question of morality. Um, but if you go back one slide, you've got the sort of design uh, test cycle. Um, this is fine for the software. So, so it, it's just a, really raising the awareness that there are moral and ethical concerns with, with, these, with dealing with living organisms. Um, it's really difficult to wade into that territory without, without getting so lost that it's hard to come back. Um, we already utilize many organisms today f to serve human needs. And I think because we're starting from scratch, we're going to be engineering organisms here that are on the order of yeasts and algae and bacteria. Bacteria have a bad rap, so yeasts are starting to win and, and in terms of getting into the application space. Thank God for beer. Um, it's true. <laughs> Fortified foods. <laughs> the, uh, when it comes to ethics, uh, I think we're really going to have some fascinating challenges because I've always looked at ethics as being a market. You can't really look at ethical behavior without looking at the environment that the ethical that the behavior is occurring in, and and the environment around living organisms is changing very quickly. So better minds than mine will tackle these problems. I, I'm just compulsive about trying to accelerate this loop and see what we can make out of it. And I, and I believe that as a species, we tend to make positive applications and do good things. Yes, you will find outliers that, that will do nefarious things. But for the most part, we, we apply these, these tools and technologies for good. An optimist, perhaps. Please, Nick.
stronger divide between us and animals? Well, I, we have a. So the question there was was uh, will yes. So the the question was uh, is the is the connection as if let me paraphrase it is the connection between animals and ourselves going to get stronger or weaker as we start to uh, generate more creatures uh, with these technologies, roughly. Um, it, we have uh, we have a very strong connection to every living thing on this planet. Um, one of the things as a genetic as a geneticist, when I started looking at the bacterial genome in the late 1980s and starting to run searches on it with the sequences that were coming from human beings, you find that we are connected through this through this code. We are all linked, and in fact, we still have one consensus code. For DNA, the, the 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 translation table really is conserved across all living things. So this is a very important point. We have this connection, and I believe that we are going to maintain this connection through the code. I think that trying to make divergent genetic codes is dangerous and 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 important maybe for some applications. But because we haven't seen it, it's kind of like making parallel IP standards. <laughs> Um, the information gets all confused. Um, will we start treating these organisms like commodities? Will we start abusing them in certain ways? Will we think they're cheap? I can argue that in many ways we already do that. Um, but there are some organisms that we treasure and will fight to the death for. I, I don't know where the dividing line will be. But I've seen people run into homes to, to rescue their animals from, from a fire or, or concerns. We certainly love and protect our children and the people we love to the deaths. So. Um, wow, a lot of hands. Uh, I think you were the first. Sarah. So the question was essentially there's, there's often competing standards as new technologies are built out. And this goes back to my comment to Neil. Um, we, we are already seeing competing standards for genetic code. Um, people have, have already suggested that they can make proprietary codes and that this is in some ways safer because the organisms will effectively be isolated from the other organisms. Their code won't be able to cross, which is an interesting idea. Um, the, I don't know the answer to that. I think some people will do proprietary codes and proprietary organisms that simply will not be able to exist in the natural world. I don't know what the ramifications of that are. All I know is nature doesn't give us many examples to go and study of that um, because it seems to be pretty much consensus for most of the living things. Um, sorry. Um, <clears throat> what do you think Darwin did a good thing about what would Darwin think of it? Okay, what would Darwin think of it? I think he'd love it because, it's, because, because we're going to see more species created in the next hundred years than in the last several million. And, yeah. and also, uh, you mentioned about the laboratories that are uh, still working in the same fashion that many, many years ago. So how, what, what do you think, what do you invest in is the future of laboratories? Okay, and, and the second comment was that the, lore, the, the labs today, the molecular biology labs today, still look pretty similar uh, the, as they did 30 years ago. And in fact, they're pretty much housed in many of the same types of areas, you know, generally large companies, military groups, academic universities. Um, really, what we're going to see is that lab is probably going to be a little box that you can have in your pocket. Uh, a lot of the work is going to be designed uh, in, in the software realm, and there'll be other parties that will ultimately translate that design into something real. There'll be third-party providers. We're already seeing that appear. But certainly for the synthesis side, it's just, and, and booting up a bacteria or a virus, it, it'll just be a desktop device very quickly. Uh, um, sorry, I'm just overwhelmed. Please, Margo. Um, 
Um, patenting, most of the old biotech patents are worthless um, they're because the environment's changing so fast. So I just, uh, for people that are interested in intellectual property, I usually say go and study software patents and, and computer hardware patents. I think that'll be the, the closest that you can find for this new technology and we'll provide some guidance. Uh, myself, I used to work with the big biotechs and had all the, uh, the lawyers always following us around. That's why I do everything open source today. I don't even like to sign NDAs. Okay, so the, the comment there was uh, when, when, when he writes computer code, it's basically fixed. It doesn't, it doesn't mutate. And that if you write genomic code and it's put into an application, there's the risk that oh, as it's growing and duplicating, uh, it will mutate and change over time. Um, in fact, if you write computer code and you put it open source, you will find it mutates very quickly. Um, very quickly. Uh, what you, if you're actually making an application and you don't want it to change, uh, well, that happens quite a bit, actually. We call it species. We, we put a firewall around it. We don't allow free information exchange very easily with the environment. There's still a little bit of leak and crosstalk through viruses and other, and other breaks through the system. But for the most part, it stays stable, sometimes for, for very long periods. We haven't changed much in hundreds of thousands of years. You can also put in checksums and other error points and, and other protection mechanisms that say, if I'm not working properly, turn off. Sorry. Great. Do you think we'll be able to bring back dinosaurs? Will we be able to bring back dinosaurs? Um, there was actually an article in the Wired magazine I picked up at the airport on the way here uh, with a guy named Raul Cano, who um, was a microbiologist that in 1995 uh, got a lot of attention because he was taking uh, organisms trapped in amber getting them out of the amber in a sterilized, in a sterile way and looking at some of the microbes that were trapped, say, on the insect, on the, I think it was bees he was working with. Um, and so that was about the same time as Jurassic Park and he was, he was on this whole lecture circuit. And then it all died away. Um, let, uh, he's since made something, the Fossil Fuels Brewing Company, which is pretty cool, uh, with the yeast recovered from that. Will we be able to get dinosaurs? I think that... Uh, uh, we already make these big, giant animatronic dinosaurs. I see no reason why, if we wanted to engineer dinosaurs again for whatever would prompt us to do it, that we could not do that. So, yes, we could do that. Um, oh, sorry, creature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned, we mentioned the DNA print, uh, prints and printers. Yep. And we have, right now, a legal system that's pretty heavily relied on DNA being sort of like 100% elements for conviction. Um, how do you see that unfold? I mean, if we're able to print DNA, <coughs> so if I have, for instance, your DNA, I can basically print it and kind of then put it somewhere. And the legal system, we have it right now. Mm -hmm. And the legal system is kind of, where there's a DNA match, it's pretty much 100% conviction. How do you see those two kind of uh, unfolding in the next three to five years? Um, uh, so the question is, uh, we, we, right now we can basically copy any DNA that's out there right now and print it for ourselves. So uh, again, uh, and how is this going to change uh, kind of the, the environment? I, I draw a lot of examples from computing and biology. And if I look at, if I look at genetics, uh, there's a tremendous amount of free exchange of information in the microbial world. Tremendous. In the higher organisms, again, we start to, we start to build firewalls, these species barriers. Um, but even bacteria have, have defenses, these restriction enzymes that chop up foreign DNA. Uh, it's going to be really, really noisy. Uh, if you want to protect a piece of DNA code, my advice is never, ever put it into the environment. Never share it on any system uh, because it's like, like anything that's digital, once you let it go, it's free. If you have a living organism that, that is in the environment, uh, freely in the environment, anyone's going to be able to copy and, and grab code from that. And so today in the biotech world, what we do is we make organisms and we put it in controlled reactors, and we put that controlled reactor in a secure building, and we restrict the access to that building. Following that, 
done. I, I, if I were, I don't know, uh, uh, indicted in a certain crime based on my DNA being there, will it be right now? Um, good line of defense to say we have means of printing DNA. Who said it's my? I mean. That's a really good point. Um, um, it would, uh, once we get to the being able to knock off a human genome, it will. I think, yes, the DNA. Uh, so the question, sorry, I'm just going to repeat that, was because it's a good one. Um, right now, if he, was, if he was in court and his D DNA was being used as uh, evidence against him, could he use as a line of defense, well, we can synthesize DNA. Maybe someone planted it. Maybe I was not here. Um, right now, it would be pretty difficult to synthesize a piece of DNA that would convince a court of law. In 20 or 30 years, I think it would be very, uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting line of defense. I, don't, I think DNA defense is going to go away. Back corner blue shirt. All right. Yeah, that's blue shirt. <laughs> uh, okay, so one of the things that I think that might be stifling to this industry in the near future is um, concerns from Homeland Security. So I, I'm starting to see the, the trends where they may put in significant um, restrictions on how much information can go into the general public. Yes. Uh, and so how do you see that evolving in the next few years and how dangerous do you think that's going to be to the Open source and open collaboration. Yep. So the, the comment in, uh, was that uh, essentially raising awareness that Department of Homeland Security and the security agencies are, are, are starting to wake up to some of this and how is that going to change the environment over the next few years. Um, that was a really big concern of mine five years ago. Um, it, I really worried about this. At the time, I was working independently and traveling across the border. I'm Canadian. And I started thinking, man, I'm talking about this stuff. Am I going to get plucked and sent off to a room somewhere for bioterrorism? What uh, even... Uh, but the field has grown to become uh, recognized as a powerful tool in molecular biology. It's, uh, the iGEM program has been really powerful in... in uh, demonstrating that this is a tool that, that teenagers will drive forward and that youth will drive forward and that is really already international. So it's very hard to build the same type of, of protectionist thinking that was built up around, say, nuclear technologies. Uh, this is a universal technology. And since DIY Bio appeared in April of last year, almost immediately... The, the defense groups, FBI, CIA, DHS, started to build relationships with DIY Bio. Now, they already had existing relationships with the academics and, and groups that were doing synthetic biology in, in academia and, and commercially. But now the dialogue really got pushed down. How are we going to work with the kids on this and stay up to date with the changes. So it's too late to firewall and protect it and put it underground. If, they, if, it try, if it gets squelched, the main risk is that you'll lose leadership. We saw this in stem cell technologies. You simply don't want to lose leadership in broad-based genomic technologies. It's like saying, computers, they're not important. They're too dangerous for people to use. That, that's the risk. I think it would, it would economically and technologically destroy leadership for any nation that puts in overly restrictive policies. That being said, we need, we need smart, safe defense systems. So let's build a good defense industry. Um, there was anything else? Uh, please. Sorry. You're not. Okay. Is there any restriction, physical or chemical restriction, that doesn't permit the uh, the creation of new species or new animals. Like, is there any limit that physical? Who is there any limit to uh, the question? Was is there any limit to what you can make with this technology? And go out and look in nature, and we've got about two million species, you know, of all shapes and sizes. Those are each applications, and the evolutionary biologist types will tell you that's just a small sampling of what we had over the last four billion years. This is, and these are just species that appeared and found niches and energetic environments and success in the natural world. Um, I know that we create an unnatural world that, that also we can start to shape the evolution of. So no, I, I don't know what the barriers are. I believe we will be engineering proteins to do things that are absolutely remarkable. We're already using proteins and viruses in batteries. What happens when you make 
a cell that truly functions like, a, like an electronic computer or can interface seamlessly with an electronic computer. We're, we're going to see that. We are already putting electrodes into our brain. What happens when every cell in our body is connected to an electronic processor? These are within the realms. Rex. That's the last one. Okay. So, uh, I mean, reiterating the point that Rod brought up, uh, that because now we're able to print DNAs, shouldn't we also be thinking about like mutations, risk analysis, whenever we, we print, let's say, an ordinance? I mean, can't we learn from biochemistry, like the, the parts of DNA that are prone to mutations, or even three empirical studies, uh, where we can uh, assess the risk of certain genes being from being mutated, and, and shall we incorporate that into uh, analysis whenever we print them? Uh, so the question was, can we essentially, through our knowledge and understanding of these uh, of of biochemistry and other systems, uh, engineer in good checkpoints against mutation? Um, and unwanted mutation. And I think for the most part, yes, we, can, we will do that and we will understand, uh, but it'll never be 100% complete. Remember, uh, when you talk about cancer, what you're really talking about is a one in a hundred trillion event where a, where, a mutations have, where a mutation has slipped through all the, the internal cellular and external monitoring systems to persist and act as an infection in our own bodies. Very extremely rare event over the operating period of a human, which is you know, 85, 85 years on average. Not many machines last 85 years. Um, so this is, uh, we'll learn from these things. It will never be complete. So we, once, essentially, once it's out there, you, you lose some control of it. Thank you.